these two here, analyticity and contingency, are also logical contradictions. Um, I'll point out, I think, it's worth bearing in mind that, that these two, necessity and impossibility, these two are not logically contradictory. Uh, you, you might say, well, it is. You might say, you know, if you've got, um, you know, look, you've got here uh, necessarily not P and necessarily P. Um, but, of course, for something to be a logical contradiction, the uh, the negation has to be at the, at the start of the formula. Um, these these two are not contradictions. For that to be the case, this would have to be not necessarily P. Um, and indeed there are actually systems of modal logic in which we can say that P is both possi not possible and necessary and that's a, a kind of quirk of the particular logic which we'll come to later but just keep in mind that these two they aren't contradictories and um, conversely although these connections between necessity and possibility uh, hold intuitively uh, they don't hold um, in the case of they don't hold in virtue of the logical form. Um, you see, all, all these other relations they hold in virtue of the logical form. Um, for example, uh, if if you assert necessarily p, then you can immediately derive from that necessarily p or not necessarily p just by uh, uh, disjunction introduction, right? Um, but necessity doesn't imply possi possibility in the same way. Um, uh, as you can see, it's, there's not that sort of logical connection between the two. So those relations there are not in virtue of the logical form. Possibility doesn't, doesn't have to depend on necessity in the, uh, in the same way. Um, and as I said, there are logics where things turn out to be both necessary and not possible. Um, so you can sort of see here the uh, relations, that those things that are relations in virtue of the logical form. Uh, and of course then we've got these intuitive relations here. Um, and we can add other things to this. Uh, we can think take, take uh, not necessarily, for example. And there's one for you to think about. Uh, what would it imply and what would it rule out? Which of the relations are true intuitively and in which are true purely in virtue of the logical form. So uh, that's one for you to think about there. Okay, moving on. Um, now, uh, a very important element of uh, modern modal logic is uh, the concept of possible worlds. Uh, in a later video I'll define more uh, I'll define possible worlds in, in a more formal manner, but it's good to get an, an intuitive sense of what's going on here. So possible worlds are essentially a way of uh, conceptualizing modal notions. It's a way of uh, conceptualizing ideas of possibility and, and necessity. Um, so there are many ways that the, uh, the world might have been. Um, in our world, in the actual world, the Cold War stayed cold. We didn't initiate a nuclear holocaust. But uh, of course things could have been different. Uh, it, it could have been the case that the instruments malfunctioned or the control of the big red button was given to a crazy person. Uh, a nuclear holocaust might have happened. Now what you're doing here is imagining a different possible world. In the actual world we avoided nuclear holocaust but in some possible world we didn't. Now, um, for every way that things might have been different, uh, there's a possible world. For every way things might have been. Um, there's a possible world where pigs fly. There's a possible world exactly like ours, except there's a celestial teapot orbiting the sun between Earth and Mars. Um, for any possibility, there is a corresponding possible world. Uh, so, when we say it is possible that P, uh, on this concept of possible worlds, what that means is that in some possible world P is the case, or there is a possible world at which P obtains. So uh, if P is true in at least one possible world, then possibly P is true in our, in our actual world. We can also think about things that are necessary. 
uh, like 1 plus 1 equals 2, again, a, a good candidate for a statement that's always going to be true. You can change the world in whatever ways you, you want. You can engage in whatever flights of fancy you like, but there's no world at which uh, 1 plus 1 doesn't equal 2. At, at all worlds, 1 plus 1 equals 2. Um, so this statement is considered to be necessary. It's necessary because it's true in all possible worlds. So we interpret necessarily P as meaning in all possible worlds, P is the case, or uh, P obtains in all possible worlds, or however you want to phrase it. Uh, now consider, say, impossibility. Um, it, it's presumably impossible for Joe and Reuben to both be taller than each other. Um, uh, it's possible for Joe to be taller than Reuben, so in, in some possible world, Joe is taller than Reuben, and in some other possible worlds, uh, Reuben is taller than Joe. But there's no possible world at which Reuben and Joe are taller than each other. Um, if P is not possible or, or impossible, then there are no possible worlds at which P obtains. And, and uh, notice that we could instead use necessarily not P for this, rather than not possibly P. Um, because if, there are, if, if P is false in all worlds, then not P must be true in all possible worlds. If there's no possible worlds at which P is true, then in all possible worlds not P must be true. Um, so that sort of, you can see that possible worlds talk captures the uh, definition I used in the earlier slide when I talked about impossibility. You can see that they're interchangeable. And um, the same is true of uh, possibly not P and not necessarily P, because if P is false in at least one possible world, then it can't be true in all possible worlds, obviously. Possibly not P just means not P is the case in at least one possible world. So clearly it's uh, the same as not necessarily P. Okay, so I hope that this gives you some intuitive sense of what possible worlds are. Uh, now, when we talk about possibility, we don't have to talk about possible worlds just in general. We can impose restrictions on the class of possible worlds that we're referring to. And this helps, uh, this is necessary for when we're talking about different kinds of possibility. So uh, consider, for example, logical possibility. This is what is possible given the laws of logic. And this is, this is generally seen as the most broad kind of possibility, because this just rules out contradictions. So propositions such as Socrates both is a man and is not a man. All the worlds that are possible are logically possible. Um, so that's the broadest kind of possibility that we might be talking about. But you can, you could also be talking about uh, nomological possibility. And this is what is possible given the laws of nature in the actual world. So I might say, for example, that it's possible, it's impossible to break the speed of light, or it's impossible to walk through walls, or it's impossible for pigs to fly. Now, none of these statements are are logically contradictory. They don't seem to contravene any laws of logic. It's just that relative to the laws of nature in our world, they're impossible. So we can restrict the class of possible worlds. There are, there are some possible worlds where the laws of nature are different, where pigs can fly and the speed of light can be broken. But it's still reasonable to say it's impossible to do those things, and it's because when we say it's impossible to do those things, we're talking about a restricted class of worlds. We're talking about the class of possible worlds which sh that share our laws of nature. Um, you can restrict it further. You might talk, for example, about temporal possibility, and this is what is possible given the actual history of the world. So it's no longer possible for the Cold War to cause a nuclear holocaust because the Cold War is over now. If I was to say it's impossible for the Cold War to cause a nuclear holocaust, well, that, that's true in one sense. Of course, in another sense, it isn't true because the Cold War could have caused a nuclear holocaust. 
and indeed there are many possible worlds in which the Cold War did cause a nuclear holocaust. Um, but the point is that in all of those possible worlds that share our history up to you know, the end of the Cold War or the year 2000 or whatever year, in all of those possible worlds the Cold War did not result in a nuclear holocaust. So you can talk about possibility rel relative, what's possible relative to the history of our, of our world. Um, now those are just uh, some of the many restrictions that you might impose upon the class of possible worlds. But um, I mean that should just sort of show you uh, how you can how you can use possible worlds to think about these different kinds of possibilities. Um, th those definitions I've sort of given there, these intuitive definitions, are perfectly standard, but they are all controversial. Um, it's it's worth pointing out there is still some debate about all of those. Okay, well uh, that's that's it for this for this video. Uh, I'll talk about possible worlds again very soon in a more formal context, but uh, I hope that was helpful.